You're listening to episode 99, Reclaiming Your Life by Choosing How You Move Forward, with Sasha Joseph Newlinger. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you so much for tuning into this episode, the first episode of 2017. So I'm really excited to have you here and happy new year to you. I hope that you're looking forward to this year and all of the possibilities that it holds. And I really do wish nothing but the best for you this year. So I hope that it'll be a good year for all of us. And first off, I just want to apologize for not releasing this episode last week. I know I had mentioned that the first episode of the year would be last Monday, but unfortunately I had some things come up that I needed to attend to and that led to the delay in getting it out to you. So I apologize for that, but I'm definitely excited to bring you this episode. I'm going to be joined by Sasha Joseph Newlinger, who you might um, know of from his TEDx talk entitled Trauma is Irreversible, How It Shapes Us is Our Choice. And he's also the director of his upcoming documentary film based on his life story entitled Rewind to Fast Forward. But before we get into this episode and I tell you about the things that we're going to be talking about here I do just want to remind you that the next episode is 100, and that's going to be coming up in two weeks on the 30th, and I'm going to be answering your questions for that episode. And so if you're listening to this around the time it's gone live and you have a question for me that you'd like me to answer during that episode, then go ahead and submit that to me. The cutoff is going to be the 19th, so it only uh, gives you a few days probably, but if you have a question, and it can be related to pretty much anything. Um, It can be about bullying, it can be about my story, um, my healing journey, something that you want to know about me personally, uh, anything really. I'm happy to feature that in the episode and answer that for you. So if you have a question, go ahead and submit that to me at melissa at thegrassgetsgreener.com. And if you do that by the 19th, then I am more than happy to include that in the episode and answer that for you then. So Sasha is going to be sharing his story with us today about how he grew up in a family where there was multi-generational sexual abuse and how he was abused from the time he was four years old up until um, eight years old. And I do just want to issue a trigger warning, uh, especially if you are a sexual abuse survivor, that you know what we talk about here could definitely be triggering for you. So just keep that in mind going into it. But we get into a lot of great stuff here, and Sasha is going to tell us about, you know, not only how he was affected by what he went through, but how he's been able to turn it around and get to where he is today. And some of the things we're going to talk about are the confusion that can come from being abused and why it's happening and not understanding that. And he's going to share with us the incident that led him to realize that the abuse was wrong and that it wasn't his fault and what ultimately led him to disclose it. We're going to talk about the difference between a victim and a survivor He's going to share how his abuse affected his dad, who was also abused growing up. Sasha's going to share about what it was like for him to go through three different trials against his abusers. He's going to share when his healing journey began and the mindset shift that happened for him. He's going to talk about how his past kept coming up for him because he hadn't dealt with it, and his struggle with unhealthy relationships and how he was able to finally break free of that pattern. And then he's going to tell us more about his film, Rewind to Fast Forward. So again, lots of great stuff here. I'm really excited to bring this episode. And without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it. And I'm going to bring Sasha on. Sasha, welcome to the podcast. And thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to have you here and, you know, grateful for the opportunity. I know you're a busy guy. Um, and so <laughs> I first uh, came across you and your story from your TEDx talk called Trauma is Irreversible, How It Shapes Us is Our Choice. And that'll be linked up on the show notes page. And I definitely recommend anyone listening to to this to go check that out as well. But ultimately, Sasha, we got connected through a mutual friend, Rick Gabrielli of the Marriage Boss podcast. 
And shout out to you, Rick, if you're listening. Um, and I'm glad that we got connected because not only do you have an inspiring and hopeful message to share as you did in your talk, but you've also been working on a documentary film about your story called Rewind to Fast Forward. And I definitely wanted to have you on to not only share your story, but to tell us about the great things you're doing today in the areas of child advocacy and child abuse prevention. So, Sasha, what I like to do here is basically start at the beginning of your story and have you share with us what you'd like us to know about what you experienced growing up so that we know where you're coming from, and then we'll go from there. How does that sound? That sounds wonderful. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I know, you know. Yeah, I, I know for you it was um, multi generational sexual abuse, right? So tell us kind of how old you were and, and what happened there. Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, we had, we had, when I say we, my family and I, we had a really beautiful, uh, kind of picturesque, picturesque life. When I look back at the old uh, home video that I have, and I and I think upon some of my earliest memories, um, you know, we had a beautiful Victorian home, wraparound porch, big front yard, backyard, bunch of family parties and events. It was there was food and it was beautiful, um, and there are a lot of beautiful memories from my childhood. Um, and um, right around the time that I was four years old, uh, just to turn four, um, uh, I was sexually abused for the first time. And in that moment, um, my, my ability to see myself as, um, a beautiful individual to feel love, um, experience joy, um, or, or to, um, feel connected to those around me, all of that was severed. I felt just lost in pain and I couldn't understand why I was being hurt or even what exactly was happening to me because it's hard for a child to understand what child sexual abuse is. So all I knew is that what was happening to me was extremely painful. And I thought that if this painful thing was happening to me, it must have been because I was awful and I deserved it. Um, and it was three different abusers over the course of the next four years of my life. My uncle Howard, my uncle Larry, and his son, my cousin Stuart, who all sexually abused me on separate occasions, multiple occasions over a four year period. And so um, that just led to more confusion and pain. And over those four years between the ages of four and eight, I just felt that, you know, um, I felt that, you know, what was happening to me was just reinforcement that I was dirty, disgusting, unlovable. Um, and it was confusing for me because, you know, I'd go, you know, sometimes uh, an abuser would abuse me when they were when they were at a family event. But then the next time they were at a family event, they wouldn't abuse me. But maybe a different family member would. It was Howard, Larry or Stuart. And what was even more confusing is after an abusive traumatic event, we, which would uh, typically happen in my bedroom, um, most of the events did, um, we would then uh, walk down the stairs and, you know, my family would, would greet us with open arms. You know, maybe my mom would hand one of my abusers a piece of pie or my dad would give them a hug. And so it was hard to understand, you know, whether or not my parents were aware of what was happening to me. And on some level, I thought that they were. So confusion, pain, paranoia, um, self-loathing, um, disconnection from the beauty of life. It was, it was awful. And, um, and when that happens wonder, at, at that age, I mean, that's, that, that's even worse, right? It just, it doesn't set you up well for later on. No, no, not at all. And I mean, you know, um, you know, and there were, you know, my uncle ha Howard, you know, um, one of, um, one of the pieces that he pled guilty to, you know, terroristic threats, um, you know, endangerment of welfare of the child. He, he would um, threaten me, you know, if you tell anyone, I'll kill you. And so I believed that. And I wasn't going to tell anybody about what was happening to me. Um, I felt that I deserved the abuse. But um, one day when I was walking up the stairs to the attic where my cousin Stuart, one of my abusers at the time, was living with us, he was living in the attic. Um, as I was walking up the stairs uh, to essentially be abused by him because uh, he had asked me to come to his room, as I was walking up the stairs, um, I saw my little sister walking down the stairs. And 
we didn't exchange any words, but uh, just in looking into her eyes, I could see her pain and, you know, she was tearing up. And I realized that what my abusers were doing to me, they were also doing to her. Um, and at least at that point, all I could connect was Stuart. And it was just, you know, it was Stuart that was hurting her. Um, and I realized that, you know, even though I felt that I deserved to be abused, because that's where my mental state was, I realized that, you know, wow, this is wrong. It was the first time in my childhood that I realized that what was happening was wrong, because even if I thought I deserved it, my sister was the most beautiful person in my life, and I couldn't understand how or why anyone could hurt her. And I realized that if someone could hurt her, they were a bad person. They were doing something bad, and it was wrong. And so shortly after that incident, um, I, I told my mom about Stuart and what was happening uh, in his room. And um, from there, it just kind of snowballed, and I, I got the help I needed and uh, started disclosing more information in therapy. Mm. And now your dad had been abused growing up as well, right? Yeah, you know, he he was the youngest brother. Um, so Larry and Howard, uh, two of my abusers, also abused him when he was a child. Um, I think Howard was, uh, I believe he was 16 years older than my dad, or four, no, 14 years older than my dad. And I think Larry was 10 or 11 years older than my dad. So there's, you know, um, there was a huge age gap. And uh, so he, you know, he was stuck in the silence for most of his life until I actually said something. Mm. Um, so he didn't and, say anything about his abuse until you had opened up about yours? No. And what's interesting about that and what we cover in the film too is, you know, a lot of people ask, well, if he knew that they were abusers, how come he didn't say anything? How come he let them into your house? And um, it's a great question. But, you know, in examining, you know, I mean, like just the story I just told you, I wasn't going to tell anybody that I was being abused until I realized my sister was being abused. And it was such a shock to me that my sister was being abused because she was beautiful and, and sweet. In my mind, I thought that I was being abused because I was dirty, disgusting, and unlovable. And the abuse could only be happening to me because I'm dirty, disgusting, and unlovable. Same idea where, you know, my dad's a child and he believes that he's being abused again and again and again because he's dirty, disgusting, and unlovable. But in that, in that mindset, you don't expect that these people could hurt someone who you perceive to be beautiful mm. or worthy of love or worthy of um, uh, a beautiful life. You know, you, as, a, as an abuse victim, before there's help and healing, you know, one feels di one disconnected from joy, from beauty, from love. And there's a strong belief that they did something to deserve it. And so, um, you know, my dad was the youngest child. He didn't have, you know, any kind of outside perspective to show him that what was happening to him could also happen to somebody else. Um, you know, if I didn't have my sister in my life and I didn't, if I hadn't run into her on that stairwell, I, don't, I wouldn't have told anybody. And I would have grown up believing that um, they abused me and only me and that I was just a specific target. Not that this is, you know, not that it's their fault, but it's my fault. And I think that's part of how this epidemic continues to um, travel from generation to generation, you know. Um, First, I want to be clear that, you know, um, it's only only 30 percent of abuse victims grow up to become abusers. It's not the, the mass majority of people who are abused. But for those other 70 percent who don't grow up to abuse, um, there are all kinds of self-esteem issues, self-love issues, um, self-worth issues, um, skewed ways of seeing the world um, through a victim mindset, through the, the eyes of the victim that can prevent that victim from truly, um, truly embracing all that life has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest different, the difference between a victim and a survivor is that um, the victim is stuck in the past and the survivor um, acknowledges the past every day, um, but is, is, has gotten to a point where they are willing to embrace the part of themselves that is afraid that is scared, that is traumatized, and examine, and examine that part of themselves. I think that's, you know, the, the difference. I still have days where I really struggle, and um, they're less and less as I continue to look inward and, 
and, you know, work in therapy and heal. But, you know, it's not, you know, when a child is abused, you know, that that's a moment that will be a part of, you know, their memory and what shapes them forever. And, and the question is, how does it shape them? Which is, you know, where my talk came from, my TEDx talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was your dad's reaction when he found out that this was happening to you and to your sister? Oh, I mean, you know, he, you know, he could describe it the best and, and he will talk about it in the film. You know, I asked him that, you know, because I was just a kid, you know, when, when this all came out. But, he, you know, he he felt betrayed. Um, he felt extremely sad and, and guilty. Um, he felt, uh, and it also kind of reopened a wound from his childhood that he had suppressed for so many years. You know, he thought, you know, he got to a certain age where they stopped abusing him. And then, you know, eventually he left the house, left left his, his abusive home, and started trying to sculpt a life for himself. And he, he really thought that the abuse was over. His brothers, you know, um, were much more friendly with him as adults. And he thought that the nightmare was over. And I think a lot of his pain and unresolved trauma um, was repressed. And so when this all came out, fear, shame, guilt, and uh, sorrow, but also a reopening of his, the pains of his past. Mm. Uh, which led to a really intense healing process for him as well. Yeah, I can imagine. And then you ended up going through trials after this came out, right? Yeah, yeah. So I testified against all three of my abusers. And, um, you know, it, it. I thought that when I finally told um, my parents and then my psychiatrist what had happened to me, that the nightmare was over. But I would say that um, the prosecution process was a form of secondary trauma, um, not so much because of the trials with Stuart and Larry, but because of the trial with Howard. Um, so yeah, and, and I, each one had to be separate, right? So you went through correct. three different trials? Three different trials. Um, yeah. Larry, Larry confessed when police brought him in. Um, and then when he finally lawyer, lawyered up, the lawyer suggested, hey, you know, um, rescind your confession, which does not look good in court. So Larry went down very quickly. Um, it was 11 years in prison. Um, when his son Stuart saw, um, when his son Stuart saw uh, the sentence that his father got, um, he, he asked for a plea bargain, pled guilty, um, and he spent, I think it was a year and a half uh, behind bars. Now, both Larry and Stuart, when they finally broke down and, um, and for in my Uncle Larry's case, he confessed and Stuart pled guilty, both of them told police that when they were children, they were abused as well. So Larry told police that when he was a child, his older brother, Howard, had also abused him. And Stewart um, told police that when he was a child, his father, Larry, had abused him. So this opened up a huge, a, a much bigger web of abuse that um, kind of tipped in, you know, it, it helped police realize that this was a multi-generational chain of abuse that led all the way back to Howard. He's kind of the top of this abuse chain. Mm. Um, and my uncle Larry was actually willing to testify in court along with my dad, in my case, against Howard. Um, and Howard, um, Howard had four attorneys, all of which were paid for by members of the Temple Emmanuel congregation. Um, so it wasn't the congregate, it wasn't the temple that was paying for, uh, his defense fund, but, um, it was members of that congregation. And I, I mean, what happened was, you know, Larry and Stewart fell fast and maybe I think I was. 10 years old by the time both by the time justice had been brought to both Larry and Stuart. Um, but it wasn't until the day before my 17th birthday that my um, case against Howard finally ended before the last court day. I mean, it took, it took seven years um, to get justice with Howard and um, in large part because of the amount of money they were able to throw at the defense um, Appeals, 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 and actually they appealed uh, my uncle Larry's ability to um, testify, um, and my dad's ability to testify, and they appealed it all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. 
um, where it was determined that my dad and my uncle Larry could not um, testify because of statute of limitations because too much time had passed, mm. um, which is one of the key legal issues that I'm currently working on shifting today as a public speaker, as a child advocate, um, as someone who's been through the system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a brutal experience for sure. The trials were um, were a form of secondary trauma because no matter how much I tried to move forward, there was always some looming court date that kept me kind of anchored in the past. Right. So you're kind of just going through all of this stuff from the age of four to 17. Like you're just kind of yeah. traumatized in one way or another. Um, so when did things start to shift for you? So I know you, you know, you said like you, you dealt with things like self-esteem issues and, you know, having trouble really just liking who you are, you know, and, and having this kind of distorted perception of things, um, which is all just, you know, very common to what, you know, a lot of uh, abuse survivors um, go through. So when did things start to shift for you? When did you start kind of on, on, the, on your healing journey? Um, I think it started um, on, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was the day that I got to um, look Howard, you know, in the, in the face and, you know, in court and read my victim impact statement and uh, tell him that, you know, I thought that, you know, no matter what happened, no matter how much he did traumatize me, um, you know, he wasn't going to win. He wasn't going to take the rest of my life from me. And um, I'm not suggesting that survivors need to look down the barrel, so to speak, and look right into the eyes of their abusers and say that to start the journey. But I think for me, what was valuable about that was, you know, making the conscious decision that um, there was still life after abuse. And even though I still had a lot of internal obstacles, like you're talking about the self-esteem self-love issues, um, I was going to, I was going to one, recognize them as a symptom of the pain that I experienced as a result of abuse, and two, in recognizing them, do everything I possibly could to um, reclaim my life by accepting that despite the abuse, I do have a choice on how I move forward. Even if I feel pain on a daily basis, even if I struggle on a daily basis, I'm going to consciously make an effort every day to do something that reinforces to me that I'm valuable, that I'm worth something. Um, so where, where do you was, think, uh, yeah, where do you think no, like the, the strength came from to do that? Right. Cause that's not an easy thing. I mean, no, to, to not. make that choice. Well, a couple things. One is I spent 10 years in intensive psychotherapy. Um, and I think therapy, <laughs> therapy is a workout. Like, if you, you know, if you go get ready to go to the gym, you know, you have to like get yourself ready to like beat up your body and, and get a really good workout. Therapy is the same thing, but emotionally, I think it's really hard um, to look at the source of your pain and actually like work on restructuring how you process it internally. But I do believe that, you know, therapy is incredible incredibly important and incredibly valuable to anyone who's been abused. You know, I think there's a difference between, um, you know, someone saying, I put the past behind me and I'm moving forward. There's a difference between, you know, um, ignoring or shelving the past and actually processing the past and, and dealing with it kind of from every angle with professional help to a point where you're truly willing to let go or work on letting go of some of the old mental habits and emotional tendencies that reinforce a negative self view. Um, I didn't it's do it true. It'll, own. yeah, it'll, yeah, your past will continue to come up if you don't deal with it. <laughs> 100%. And so here's, here's the second part of the story is that, you know, I thought, so shortly after, a year after that last court date with Howard, I, went to Montana, um, flew across the country to Montana uh, to study film production at Montana State University. And I thought that I thought that I had healed from my past, that all the healing was done. 
Um, but before I continue my story, what I want to say and, and highlight is I strongly believe that healing is not a destination, but a journey. Every time I feel that I've addressed something deep within myself and I've worked to heal it, it just creates room for me to recognize some other part of myself that needs love and support and, and an opportunity to heal. Every time, every time I make progress in one area, it just creates emotional space for me to recognize something inside of myself that still hurts or could use some work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, if I, you know, I'll just heal and I'll be fine. It's like, what is fine? You know, I'm learning as an adult survivor that, you know, a lot of what I thought was specific to my experience because of the abuse is actually universal. Everybody struggles to love themselves. Everybody struggles at times to recognize and remember their value or, or their beauty. Um, everybody has experienced trauma. So, you know, I, you know, but I feel like, you know, there's the fear of opening up to that vulnerability because I think a lot of times, and I know for myself, you know, I structured my whole identity very carefully um, around what hurt so that I didn't have to touch it. And mm -hmm. I recognized that you know, a few years later in college, I recognized that even though I, I healed a lot of what childhood Sasha felt, um, by disconnecting from the part of me that hurt the most, by disassociating with the abused child inside of me, I severed a part of myself from my existence. And as a result, um, as I tried to move forward, the past kept pulling me back because I wasn't actually truly embracing myself. I was embracing the quote unquote new college age Sasha, but I wasn't, um, I, I was disconnecting from the trauma of my past instead of allowing it to be a part of what I consciously used to shape who I am today. And the way I, the way I discovered that is through, you know, issues with intimacy, um, the types of relationships I was picking, you know, uh, dating really um, emotionally and verbally abusive women um, picking the wrong people to do business with. Um, and, you know, so the way I would combat my vulnerability is by, you know, showing a, a really aggressive shell. So I, I lifted weights, you know, 20 hours a week. I bicked my head. So I shaved clean. I had a goatee, wore a leather jacket. And eventually, uh, about my junior year in college, I just, I was so exhausted so exhausted from trying to create an identity for myself that neglected the truth of my past. And eventually these walls and these kind of ego based defense mechanisms crumbled to the ground because they weren't built from a solid foundation that came from within my heart. And, um, I realized that these walls gave me the illusion that I was safe, but I actually never felt comfortable in my own skin. So what were they actually doing for me? And so I, I realized I needed to tear them down. And um, mm. I, it I think scared that's, me. It scared me. Yeah, I, I think that's what can happen, right? Like, we might think that we've healed or that we're okay, but we're really just kind of, you know, trying to keep it down and, and not deal with it. And then it'll leave clues, right? And there'll be just these signs there in our life to let us know that like, hey, you're not okay. There's still stuff there to deal with. And then either you, you know, you, you make the choice to deal with it like you did, or you continue to try to ignore it and, and you know, continue to struggle because of that. Well, you know, that's a really good point. And, it, and I agree with you. You know, I think, um, Sometimes it seems like dealing with the internal struggle or the source of the pain will be harder or more grueling than just pretending it isn't there. But um, <laughs> I mean, either way, it's hard, right? <laughs> either, either way, it's hard. And wouldn't you rather be making progress towards a healthier you? Right. You know, it's uh, the 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 analogy that I've come up with, and I'm sure other people have used it, but it's. So maybe I didn't come up with it, but the analogy I like to use is that, you know, you could have a deep cut on your finger and, you know, uh, for abuse survivors, if the abuse is that cut, it's, it's hard to deal with it right then and there, um, especially if you're a child and you're alone. 
So maybe you, you stop looking at it and you pretend it's not there, but it's throbbing. But as long as you don't look at it, you can convince yourself that it's not there. You can pop pain pills. You can put a bandage on it, um, you know, just make it disappear. But eventually that infection is going to continue to get worse and worse and worse until you could get to a point where you feel that you have to amputate your hand <laughs> to, to, to uh, forget about that, that deep cut. And before you know it, you're spending so much time trying to convince yourself that the wound isn't there, that it's actually festering and getting worse, and it's taking so much valuable time and energy away from you, you actually living your life in a truthful reality, you know? Mm-hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, look, I'm not sitting here on some pedestal saying, hey, everybody, look inward and deal with what's troubling you. And because it's easy. It's not easy. It's so, it's so hard. It's grueling. I mean, the last, you know, six years of my life, you know, from college up to this point, you know, I, you know, from my junior year up to this point, I mean, they've been some of the most emotionally exhausting years of my life. But and and I've I've had to look at some of the most disturbing moments from my past, but I'm so happy that I, I chose to do it because you know I've realized why I was engaging in unhealthy relationships, which has given me the awareness and the ability to engage in healthier relationships, to set healthy boundaries with other human beings and with myself, to um, do what feels right for me, to listen to my gut, to value my opinions and my own voice. I mean, it's incredible what's come from this hard work, but I'm not here saying that it's easy. Why don't you just do it? I totally get how hard it is to do it because it's hard for me. And that's why I'm saying, you know, healing, I really believe healing is a journey, not a destination. You know, um, there's always more we can learn about who we are. And I think there's this idea that healing is to fix something that hurts. And maybe that's part of it. But I think healing is also about just becoming closer to yourself and learning more about yourself and accepting parts of yourself and the parts that are hard to accept or that don't feel right. Navigating a way to shift those pieces of who you are. So that they more accurately reflect who you want to be and how you want to show up as a human being on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that you said that you had struggled with loving yourself, right? And mm -hmm. um, how did you kind of deal with that, or how, you know, how did you get to a point where you could start to love yourself again? Um, it came with, you know, the the catalyst for kind of my my. Let me, let me backtrack here. The catalyst for um, my healing in that regard came through romantic relationships. Um, I had had a few girlfriends in a row that seemed really sweet and, and playful at the beginning um, and really almost like, you know, innocent and carefree in the sense of like, yeah, let's just be open and loving and, and together. Um, and what I would find is a pattern about a month into each of those relationships, something would start to shift. Um, they would start calling me names. They would start um, mocking me about my abusive past. They'd start um, abusing me emotionally, um, verbally, um, treating me very poorly. And, you know, it'd be easy to just say, oh, these women are awful people and, uh, you know, um, it's all their fault. Um, and how they were behaving is totally on them. But what was it inside of me that was choosing partners like this? What was it inside of me that was choosing partners that would make me feel like I was safe only to turn around and abuse me and use my vulnerabilities against me? How come I was falling into falling in love with women who were abusive? And I had to look at that. I had to examine my part in my experience. You know, yes, they were being mean and abusive, but I was choosing them. And what I realized um, is that because I was ignoring the terrified, um, emotionally distraught, and at times volatile four-year-old Sasha, that part of me, that child inside of me, who will always feel the pain of being abused as a child, because I was ignoring that part of myself, because I was ignoring the part of me that hurt. Um, I was choosing women that would hurt me and reignite that deep pain from my childhood. Women that I felt I could trust, 
but they would turn around and abuse me just like I thought I could trust my uncle, but they would turn around and abuse me. And finally, when I saw, when I realized that it was the the four-year-old child inside of me that was desperate for love and guidance, but who still feels like, like, like he's deserving of abuse and pain, I needed to step forward as an adult and say, Sasha, you deserve more. You don't deserve to be abused. And the pain inside of you from that child, from that inner child inside of you, can only be soothed by you. And only when it's soothed by you can you engage in healthier relationships. And I tell you what, that that whole discovery kind of led to um, a lot of what I cover in my TEDx talk, you know, Um, but it was it was looking at my life and saying, well, why are there certain things that just, there's certain patterns that continue to repeat themselves. And I could blame the world, but that, that is a victim mindset. I had to look inward and say, what's, what's my part in this? How come, why, why is, why is the same thing happening over and over again? And now that I've dealt with it, I, I mean, I'm in the happiest, most healthy relationship of my life. I, I've been uh, with my girlfriend for um, a year and a half and not once has she ever said something vindictive or mean or not once has she used my vulnerabilities against me, but it's also because I'm in a place in my life where I wouldn't allow that behavior anyway, because I wouldn't do that to myself because I, I am learning to love myself and call into my experience people that share my vision. But if my vision and what it was, you know, back in, you know, cut to a couple of years ago, even when you're, when my vision of myself was low when I thought that I deserved less and that's what I accepted and through self-love and looking inward I continue to elevate the quality of my experience because I'm choosing actively what is okay and what isn't what I'll accept and what I won't where my boundaries are and what I deserve as a a human being on this planet yeah it's so true that you know if we have a part of us that you know, we don't like, right? We're, we're ashamed of, or, you know, whatever, like that will affect our life today. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll show up now, you know, and until we kind of go back and, and do that kind of, you know, inner child work and help that help our younger self to heal. And because not only, you know, us today that needs to heal, but it's our younger self that needs to heal too, right? The, the younger self who, went through the trauma and who got hurt, they need to know that, you know, that, that, that they're okay. And that, and that, you know, our, our present self, you know, we love them and we, you know, accept them for who they are. And we forgive them for what happened. You know, I mean, I, I know for me, for me, like, I mean, I had to, um, I had to forgive my younger self because I found that I was continuing to like sabotage myself today because I hadn't forgiven myself for what I had gone through, but it kind of, it happens on a subconscious level too, you know? And so, yeah. Yeah. And so, or, so we kind of, yeah. And so we look at that, like it's going it to continue uh, to, to sabotage us whether we know it or not. Recognizing that, you know, that's okay. You know, that's a part of life, you know, and it's not about changing or silencing that inner voice that's in pain. I think, What's been really helpful for me is hearing the inner tantrum, hearing the fearful negative voice inside of myself, not suppressing it, but hearing every single word and then making a conscious choice to say, okay, I know you're upset. I know you feel scared, but you know what? I'm telling you, I've got you. You're beautiful. I've got this. You're safe. Saying that to myself, saying that to my inner most scared, traumatized part of myself and saying, I've got you. I love you. And you know what? Even for the answers that I don't have, I'm working to to answer them. And, um, or for the answers that I don't have, I'm working to, you know, to figure them out, to find them. And, you know, it comes back to, I think, self-love, you know, even on the days where you struggle or you say something you don't mean, or you find yourself paralyzed in fear, just acknowledging and accepting that that comes from a place of pain and a a place inside of you that still feels worthless, disgusting, unlovable, 
scared, frightened, traumatized, and saying that part of you isn't bad, that part of you shouldn't be ostracized, but actually embraced and loved, because that's what any any person who's in pain, whether they acknowledge it or not, wants a hug. And I feel like the first person that needs to give you a hug when you're in pain is yourself, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Then you can invite others to to be a part of loving you. Yeah. And it's about, you know, saying those things to our younger self that we needed to hear back then, but nobody was saying to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, I I, I know therapy can be expensive, um, but I, I, I still see a therapist every week. Um, and we don't talk about my childhood anymore, um, but we talk about what's coming up now, what I've made room for now, you know, where where I get stuck in my present day experience, you know, and and I feel like self improvement um, is and is really just you know a commitment to looking inward and taking responsibility for what your life looks like today and not mm-hmm. blaming it on the past because then then you are just trapped in in something that doesn't serve you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great that, you know, like you'll continue to get therapy today because I think a lot of times there's, you know, a stigma around that of like, well, if I'm in therapy, then, you know, there's something wrong with me or right. And so, but it can still be helpful even if you're doing better because you know, there's always stuff that's going to come up that, you know, it's going to be beneficial for you to talk about and to be able oh, to, yeah. to share with someone who's, who's not going to, you know, judge you in any way. Well, and just, just being able to offload in a healthy way too. Like, I don't want to dump the stresses of my week on my girlfriend, you know, um, or on my friends, you know, I, I'll ask them for help when I, when I need it. But, you know, sometimes it's nice to have one designated person who, who, you know, is responsible for just listening to you um, and hearing everything that's tough, everything that you struggle with and um, helping you process it, bringing an objective, um, an objective viewpoint to where you might be stuck. And sometimes that, that objectivity is all you need to figure out a pattern and do something about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that's great. And I love how, you know, you, you take care of yourself and you continue to work on, you know, becoming just, you know, better and better. But well, I, I, I appreciate that, you know, and it, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, Nothing well, easy. on like on that note, I mean, like what sorts of things are you still struggling with today? I think one of the things I struggle with today, um, and and much less than I used to, but something I'm still working on is um, uh, my relationship with my body. Um, I, you know, a lot of abuse survivors um, struggle with that, and and so you know that's something that I struggle with as well. And um, it's interesting, you know, um, you know there there have been moments where I'm absolutely ripped. Um, and, you know, in incredible physical condition. Um, and I still have struggles, I'll still struggle uh, to accept my body. And there are other moments where, you know, I'll put on some weight and I'm struggling. So it's, it's not about um, what I look like as much as it is about uh, trusting my, my physical beauty, um, trusting that I'm beautiful. And it's interesting uh, what I've been able to identify is, you know, that comes around when I'm really stressed, um, whether it's with, you know, the film or with work or uh, whatever. When I'm stressed about something in the present moment, it's easier to focus on something that I can control, i.e. my body, um, and nitpick it than it is to uh, deal with the unknowns of certain stressors that I'm dealing with in the present moment. And so as I've become more aware of that, uh, it's been easier to take better care of my body um, and, you know, um, catch myself in the act of, I guess, being mean to my body and, and saying, hold on, stop it. And then I start to remind myself about what my body's done for me. You know, it helps me play hockey. I play in two hockey leagues. It it helps me hunt and, and I've been able to fill my freezer with food for the whole year. It helps me, um, you know, connect with other human beings and it has done everything I've asked it to do. And when I start to pull myself out of the negative self-judgment um, 
and on my own remind myself of all the good things my body's done for me, it takes me out of that cycle. And it's been getting easier and easier to do that. Mm. Yeah, I think it's so important just to like have that awareness. And then when you do, then you're able to just, you know, do the things you need to do to then take care of yourself. Well, and, you know, if you strongly believe that your body is gross, like you'll subconsciously do things to hurt your body, whether it's, you know, um, starving yourself, overeating, you know, drinking, drugs, like whatever it is, if you, if you, you know, believe that your body is awful, like you'll do awful things to it. And, um, you know, it's, it's almost like, <laughs> you know, if you want to be healthy, like you have to, um, you have to first accept that you deserve to be healthy, you know, mm-hmm. and then it follows. So, um, and it's, and you know, it's a journey again, it's a journey, right? Like today I'm, you know, when I, when I was in high school, I had anorexia, you know, um, and you know, so severe eating disorders and, you know, today, um, I don't, you know, but I, but I have, you know, I have a connection to where that stemmed from. And, and I understand that there's something inside of me that still struggles to embrace and accept, uh, and so as long as I'm aware of that and I continue to work every day, it gets better. And, and it is, you know, so it's, but it's, a, again, going back to it, I strongly believe that healing is a, is a, um, journey, not a destination. Yeah, absolutely. So Sasha, uh, tell us more about what it is that you have going on today and, you know, tell us a little bit about the film. Yeah. So, um, I, so rewind to fast forward is, my autobiographical documentary about my life um, surviving and overcoming child sexual abuse. And so, um, you know, it is, um, it's been an incredible journey and it has helped. uh, It has been a therapeutic healing journey for me as well. But essentially uh, my dad, um, aside from being a survivor himself, was also um, a documentary filmmaker and is a documentary filmmaker. Uh, He actually won an Emmy last year uh, for a documentary he made, but he always had the camera around. um, And so he ended up filming over 200 hours of footage of my childhood. And, um, you know, shortly after I graduated from school, I I called my dad and I said, Hey, do you have these 200 hours of home video? And he was like, yeah, I do. I was like, send it over. So that's kind of when the journey began. I started rewatching. I rewatched my childhood. I watched myself grow up and I saw incredible moments from my childhood where I was happy moments that I had forgotten about and that had been overshadowed by, by painful memories. So I got to rewatch some of the most beautiful moments of my life, but I also got to watch how I changed once abuse started. I got to watch my abusers interacting with me at family events and I got to watch how I shifted as a human being from the eyes of an adult. And in watching that footage, I realized I needed to travel back and fill in the blanks um, that still existed from being a child who experienced this. And now as an adult, I wanted to understand it more thoroughly. So I I, uh, go home and I interview my dad. Um, I visit his childhood home where he was abused. Um, I interview my mom, the detective, my psychiatrist, the prosecutor. I revisit my past And in doing so, um, there's an epic journey of consistently pushing through fear to get closer to understanding what inside of me prevents me from moving forward. What inside of me needs more clarification? What inside of me still needs more love? And so as we're telling a chronological story from, you know, birth to present day, um, through the home video, through these interviews, at any one moment, um, we can rewind back to a moment in time or we can fast forward to a moment in time and directly connect to what it is in the story we're discussing. So, for example, um, if I'm talking about what it felt like to be stuck in the silence and in the fear of not being able to tell, we can pause in that beat and I can go right to my mom and we're talking about it and she can tell her experience and explain her experience as a mom who knew something was wrong, but she didn't know what was wrong. So there's a lot of connective power around my journey back into the past because 
it ends up, you know, being a story that shows the emotional, clinical, and legal facets of child sexual abuse, but more importantly, the healing that can come from looking backward with openness and um, and a willingness to understand uh, outside perspectives. Wow. And I, I can only imagine how going through this must have helped you in your healing journey as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, this has helped me tremendously. And, you know, um, I'm hoping that with Rewind to Fast Forward, you know, I can share this film and show, you know, what's wrong with the prosecution process? What is what are some of the causes um, and reasons behind multi-generational abuse? what a child actually goes through, what a family goes through, and what can be done to protect future generations of children while also empowering adult survivors. And, you know, in creating, you know, this film, in, in participating so, so deeply and intimately, I've filled in so many blanks for myself, which gives me a clear image of who I am and where I come from. And with that knowledge, I'm able to continue to grow into the man that, that I want to be while being grateful for the man that I am today. Mm. And that's powerful. Yeah, that's incredible. And I hope that sharing that journey uh, with the world is going to um, hopefully create a stepping stone for some survivors who are wondering, well, what's next? Or or who believe that they're the only ones on this planet who feel the way they feel. And, and it's simply not true. There's you know, it's one out of every three girls and one out of every five boys who are sexually abused before they're 18. Yeah. Yeah. Too many, too many, too many. Now I know you were telling me before we started recording that, um, you know, the film's not quite ready to be released yet, but when it is, um, is it going to like, is it, is it going to be in theaters or, is it just going to go yeah, straight? So we're, yeah. How, like how, how can, you know, people be able to watch it? Well, first things first, um, I would encourage anybody who, who feels connected to what Alyssa and I are talking about, um, go to rewind to fast forward.com. Um, there's a trailer for the film there. Um, but then there's my also, there, there, but then also there's my, uh, personal public speaking page, which is voice for the kids.com. And, some of my public speeches are on the site, some articles um, that have been written, also my TEDx talk, and, and a bunch more information really? about the film. Um, the trailer is definitely a starting point. The TEDx talk is definitely a starting point. Um, we are in the editing process right now. We're about 92% funded, so we're still raising funds. Um, but assuming the fundraising continues to go as it has, um, and assuming um, our editor and I are able to uh, stay on point, which to this point we have been able to, um, we plan to have this film done in August. And then um, we'll be applying to uh, a plethora of uh, film festivals. And so our hope is to premiere at Sundance 2018, January 2018. Um, and then from there, um, we'll go on a festival run. Uh, we hope to have a limited theater release, and we already have a, a few cities that want to do that. Um, and then from there, a uh, digital release. So Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, Hulu, Apple TV, uh, wherever we can get it. Um, but the hope is to have it um, accessible to anyone who could benefit from it. And I also hope that it could be in every language. So I, uh, I really want it to reach as many people as possible. Well, that's awesome. And I certainly wish you luck with it. And, you know, I, I look forward to being able to check it out once it's available. Well, thank you. No, it's, uh, it's exciting. And, you know, it's, it's incredible to, you know, the support that we've gotten from industry professionals, you know, uh, Ken Schretzman, you know, the editor of Cars, Toy Story 3, Monsters, Inc., you know, Secret Life of Pets. He's, he's our editor, you know, Skywalker Sound coming on board. You know, these guys, I mean, the sound designers of Star Wars, you know, to come on board and, and help us. And, um, you know, everybody's giving us good rates and really working hard to make this film possible. Um, and, you know, our Kickstarter that we did in April of 2014, you know, nearly 5,000 different people helped us raise 
$76,000 to get this, this film started. And so I just want to take this moment, too, to thank the thousands of human beings, men and women, you know, younger or, you know, older, every ethnicity, like so many people are resonating with this story and have gone one step further and have reached out and have helped us get to where we are. And I'm just deeply grateful and humbled to have received the level of support that I've received. And I can't wait to return the gift and, and bring this film to the world. Yeah, that's incredible. And again, just, you know, congratulations on all of that. I mean, that's that's amazing. And it's just great that, you know, there's so much support out there for a film, you know, for, for such an important film like yours. So it's great to see. Well, thank you so much for your your insight and your your energy and your time and the platform to to share even more. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And, and thank you. Um, and I have one final question for you today, Sasha. Yeah. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? If I could go back in time and tell myself a piece of, or share a piece of advice, if I could go back in time and share a piece of advice with myself. Um, I would say that, you, Sasha, you can't change the past. You can't control what happens around you. You can only choose how you show up in the present moment of your life. And whatever has you stressed out or filled with anxiety today, you'll have a chance to work on it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Just take it one day at a time. And above all, remember to love yourself. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I just, I love that message that you've been sharing about, you know, just the importance of loving yourself because... <laughs> We certainly, you know, get to a point w with uh, the things we've gone through where we don't love ourselves anymore or, or we don't love a part of ourselves, you know, cause, because of that shame and everything that surrounds what we went through. So uh, it's so important to be able to, to find a way to get back to that and to be able to love ourselves again because we deserve that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, everybody, I, I strongly believe that if, Everybody on this planet had weekly therapy um, and received healthy love, um, even just from one person in their lives. Uh, you know, the, the world would be healed. <laughs> Things would look <laughs> a, a lot better different, place. wouldn't they? I think so. I really think so. Yeah. So, um, I think, mean, you know. There's so many hurt people fear. out there in this world. Oh, yeah. And I think fear leads to selfishness, it leads to um, impulsivity, you know, or impulsive actions, it leads to um, uh, alienation, uh, to to other forms of abuse. And I think if you look at all of the wounds in this world, both whether it's, um, you know, the issues between nations or, you know, um, the wounds on our planet via climate change um, or the assault against um, men and women through sexual abuse or rape. I mean, what what causes one human being to so deeply wound another human being or a planet? And it's infernal pain and fear. Uh, so if every human being had an outlet to examine their inner pain and fear, if Donald Trump had an, an opportunity to uh, look at his pain and fear, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe it'd just be a little bit better, you know, maybe he'd be a little less impulsive than tweeting at 3 a.m. So, you know, I just, <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, people need an outlet to work on what hurts them so that they don't hurt others. Mm -hmm. I couldn't My agree abusers, more. If they had gotten the help that they needed as kids, maybe they wouldn't have abused me. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, it doesn't, make it okay but but no. but people definitely need to uh to get help for the hurt that they are going through so that they don't then inflict that on other people 100 percent you know yeah. because a, a healthy empowered self-loving human being um isn't going to inflict pain on another human being mm -hmm. so uh, sasha before i let you go today um I know you gave us some links a little while ago, and I'm going to have those on your show notes page. Um, any other ways that 
you want people to know about how they can connect with you or find out about what you have going on? Um, yeah, you know, um, we're on Facebook. Um, so there's my personal page, uh, public figure page, Sasha Joseph Newinger. Um, and as well as rewind to fast forward, we post updates, uh, quite regularly. Um, and then, um, yeah, you know, anybody who's interested in, in helping us get to the finish line, um, they, there's a, a way that they can reach out to us through rewind to fast forward.com. Um, anyone can email us through there. Um, and also people can make 100% tax deductible donations, uh, to the film, um, through our nonprofit conduit, um, be the example. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, rewind to fast forward.com voice for the kids.com and then following, uh, Sasha Joseph Newlinger, myself, or, um, rewind to fast forward on Facebook. It'll be huge. Share it with everybody, you, you know, you know, share these links, share the trailer. Um, there's, there's so much content that we have on our Facebook. Um, if you feel that my story has meant something to you today, um, please consider sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I will have all those links on the show notes page. And um, yeah, definitely for those listening. I mean, if if this has resonated with you, I definitely encourage you to go and, and check out what Sasha has going on and check out the film and do what you can to help support it. Um, even if it's just, you know, sharing it on social media and, and letting others know about it, because I, I really believe that, you know, films like these need to get out there so that people who who need to see them can see them and you know be benefited by them so absolutely yeah so so sasha thank you you know for your time today thank you for coming on and for sharing your story and you know i I love what you're doing and uh i wish you the best with the film and hope that you know you're able to to get it out there and that it's able to reach you know as, as many people as needs to well, thank you so much um, for your support and for this opportunity. It's it's been a dense hour, and uh, yeah, I uh, I appreciate I appreciate the platform and and the openness, and I can't wait to uh, you know see what comes next for you as well, and and to you know continue to listen to you know all of your casts. All right. Well, thank you, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Hey, you as well. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 99. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Sasha N to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave us a comment. So obviously one of the main things that we were talking about here today is self-love. And I know that that's not always uh, an easy thing, especially if you blame yourself for what happened or you know, just by feeling the shame of what you went through, it makes it really difficult sometimes to have that love for yourself. But I think you could see from Sasha's case how important developing that self-love was for him and the the role that that played in his healing. And so I want to really encourage you, if you're someone who struggles with issues of self-love and self-worth and self-esteem and all that stuff, to really try to connect with your younger self like we were talking about here in the episode, try to get in touch with that younger you who is feeling hurt and is feeling unlovable and feeling unworthy and say the things to them that they needed to hear back then and that no one has ever told them. And try that and and see if that makes any kind of difference for you because it's really a powerful thing to be able to do that. So I encourage you to, to give that a try and see what happens for you. All right, and I hope that you'll come back in two weeks for episode 100. And don't forget to submit any questions, if you have any, uh, up until January 19th. And you can send those to me at melissa at thegrassgetsgreener.com. And also, if you like what I'm doing here with the show and you want to help support it, I want to remind you that I have a Patreon campaign set up. It's over at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And that's just a way for you to help support the show and get some rewards in return for doing so. And so if that sounds like something you might be interested in, then I definitely invite you to go and check that out. That's linked up over on the website as well. And also, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. 
And as always, have hope. 